Who are we, you ask? We are the podcast seeking out a better understanding of all things paranormal. We'll have guests from all backgrounds in the paranormal with us along this journey with Q&As for listeners to ask paranormal experts their questions and open call-in nights to let listeners discuss their thoughts and experiences on the paranormal. paranormal. But the question remains, can the unexplained be explained or can the paranormal be nothing more than perception? perception. So close the curtains and turn out the lights and join us on the journey into the paranormal. This is Paranormal Engaged with your host, Adam Young, coming to you from the beautiful Evergreen State. Hello and welcome to Paranormal Engaged. This episode, we will be with Marilyn to talk about spirit guides and guardian angels. And in segment two, we will be talking to her about her book releasing here soon, Dialogues with a Mystic. Marilyn has experienced, researched, written, and taught about out-of-body travel and mysticism since 1987 and has appeared on numerous radio and television programs to discuss her thousands of out-of-body experiences. Marilyn, hi, welcome, and we're so glad to have you. Well, thank you. I'm very happy to be here with you as well. All right, so um, tell us a little bit about um, your experience and kind of how you got into all this. Uh, well, let's just do this. Uh, what was your first experience with a uh, spirit guide or guardian angel? Well, that happened like when I was nine years old. Um because I had a precursor to what would happen later. It happened again when I was about 22 years old, which is when my adult journey began. When I was nine, I had this beautiful experience with the heavens opening up, marble staircase, the angels on each side of the staircase, you know, multiple lining the staircase, the golden angels. And um, I was told a little bit at that time about my um, my journey, my spiritual journey in this lifetime, and that there would be difficulties, but that there was a plan and that this would return to me at some point. And at the age of 22, it did return. Um, and so the first experience I had at the age of 22 was in a pretty uh, typical out-of-body experience where I had, uh, you know, found myself in the vibrational state that many people talk about, which is, you know, when you feel this very, very powerful vibration, it feels like your body is vibrating um, at speeds and uh, power that you cannot fathom. Um, what I've learned over the years is that that's what you're actually experiencing, though, is that you're detaching from the vibration of your physical body to your spiritual body, which is of a higher vibration, and that's why it feels so dramatically different. But then as it progressed, you know, I went through various things and realized something was going on. I believe that I rolled over and fell out of my body. I remember that I was up, you know, up near the ceiling, seeing my lump of flesh down below. Looked like a gray clump of flesh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Looked very insignificant from that vantage point. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time being very afraid. And, um, uh, in you know, ironically, after that experience, I um, had a second one, and it came about because I prayed a great deal for um, – protection and for the next time it happened not to be so scary mm -hmm. and on each side of me were three golden angels on each side and they directed the whole experience and it was completely different where I felt very comfortable in my own skin and out of my own skin and they uh, made it a very peaceful and very um uh, very painless experience. You know, the first time I think the fear comes when you don't realize what you're really dealing with at the time. Sometimes it comes too because you think, am I dying? What's going on? You know what I mean? Right. And, you know, we don't realize um, that this kind of thing is not as uncommon 
as I definitely thought it was at the time, that was like 30 some years ago, become even more common since then. And that's partly to do with the changes that we are seeing in the spiritual capabilities of human beings. Um, so uh, those were some of the first experiences I had with guardian angels, but I've had a lot of those kinds of experiences and other kinds with them. Okay. So you mentioned out of body travel or out of body experiences and mm -hmm. it's, it's not so much as a cut of black and white as um, you, you're either in or you're not, but are there, you know, variances of states of being in that spectrum? There are, there are a lot of variances in that spectrum. That's a good point. Um, and, you know, uh, many writers on the subject have talked uh, more in the last 10, 15, 20 years about the, the fact that you also end up doing inward travel, inner body travel, because the experiences do become more internal. And a lot of experiences then don't require you to actually leave your body in order to experience them. So it's kind of, it gets more and more complex as you travel. You know, the average experience that a person might have when they have a first time uh, adventure might be something like this, where they're either floating around a room or they're floating around the neighborhood. But the uh, nature of out-of-body experiences is one of expansion. And so generally, uh, that's literally just the tip of the iceberg. What you're going to progress towards, and this is what I write about a lot in my books, to help people to understand this and then to um, experience it for themselves as well, excuse me, <coughs> is that uh, you will be traveling and learning more and more about the multidimensional universe. And uh, so it gets more and more complex. You actually just really begin to understand what St. Paul meant when he said, I has not seen nor ear heard what God has prepared for those who love him. Um, because it is a very multiplicitous existence when we leave our body. We're dealing with an infinite number of realms, all of which operate on different types of uh, spectrums of vibration. So it's a, it, there is a huge wide difference. That can also manifest here on Earth because every human being has a different spectrum of vibration whether they're aware of it or not, just in their conscious existence. So, you know, we as spiritual beings are, depending on our own awareness or lack thereof, exhibiting a certain amount of vibration uh, in our human form. But then as we start progressing, you know, we talk a lot about um, vibrational raisings in my works and the importance of them because the vibrational raisings are really the key to um, developing knowledge and wisdom and the ability to travel higher and higher because one of the first things you learn uh, as an out-of-body traveler if you do so with the proper intentions and the proper focus is that knowledge is not information, it is vibration. And so you talk about the spectrum of things and are there different spectrums. There is a huge difference in spectrums. And this is necessary. And as we actually continue to travel, we are going to go through a lot of different uh, rituals and initiations that are going to help us to raise that spectrum, which will usually come through the form of the vibrational raisings and other types of energetic boosts to um, lift 
us into the higher expression of those spectrums so that we can actually be attaining to more knowledge so that we are continually learning and moving forward because the out-of-body experience is not really intended to be, you know, just a paranormal uh, sideshow or just something interesting. It is actually like one of the greatest educational spiritual tools known to us as human beings and given to us from the spiritual world from God. And so we want to ride that spectrum properly, so to speak. Does that make sense? It sure does. Um, in fact, back when I was younger, oh, I'd say I was probably in high school at the time. Um, my first experience with it was, uh, I was actually out back and I just, it's just a very surreal, surreal feeling. Uh, but just to, like I was walking literally right beside myself as like a double, I was able to look over and I could actually see the side of, of my physical face. And it was one of the, I don't know, I want to say like the freest feeling that, uh, I've ever had, but at the same time, it was quite alarming. Yes. And so what part of it was alarming to you? What did you see that alarmed you? Uh, it was just the fact that uh, it's like just being out of your body, you know, for, for the first time ever experiencing that and just kind of seeing yourself, it's like, oh my goodness, did I, did I die? What, what took place? But I'm standing right next to myself just as a double. Right. Okay. Yes. And that is absolutely what a lot of us feel because, because it is so, you know, substantial a separation that it is a logical conclusion because you literally are having a spiritual separation from your body. It's a logical conclusion. What did I just die in my sleep? Um, you know, what exactly is going on here, you know? And so this is actually something that I think a lot of people have, um, you know, that's what the fear a lot of the time comes from. People have different fears. I covered that a lot in a book I wrote called Come to Wisdom's Door about the many different kinds of fears that people have. But this one is a real logical fear that is um, very um, common because of the fact that with people, especially who have it happen to them spontaneously when they're not expecting it, it does immediately make you wonder if something happened, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Sudden death of some sort that you're not aware of, you know? Yeah. It just felt and like I a definitely total... had that same fear when it happened the first time for me. Uh -huh. Yeah. It was, it just felt like a complete and total like phase shift. It's what it, it's, yes. it's like the best way I can describe it. It's almost indescribable in how it feels when it happens, but that's the best way that I, I've been able to kind of come through and, and kind of uh, tell about it. It's just, it's just kind of like a face shift. It just happens. You just like you slide over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So spirit, spirit guides, um, how do they differ from guardian angels? Well, the, the biggest difference would be, um, and what you have to understand here, uh, this is kind of a hard one to really pinpoint, but this goes back to vibration, but it, there's a couple of other factors. You know, when it comes to the way the spiritual world works, we can have people who operate as spiritual guides or spiritual guardian angels to us who are like, for instance, a relative of ours who, who is deceased. They can do that. They can hang around us and be a, you know, a guardian spirit. They can be there to teach or guide us. Um, but they can also be different forms of advanced spiritual souls that we don't you know, personally know, but they have been called to come in and teach us because one of the things that we do in the spiritual 
path, and we see this a lot in out-of-body travel, is that we will go for different terms, just like you do in school. If you have a certain spiritual concept you need help with and you need to understand and learn deeply, you're going to have some guidance for, you know, anywhere from three months, six months, a year, two years, however long you need, you know, and then once that has been fulfilled, then that teacher may not um, be around you anymore. A new one will come in for the next phase of your development. But what you also have, and this is the primary difference between an angel and a spiritual guide, is the fact that they are a different order of being. You know, angels in the angelic hierarchy, these are beings who were created differently from us. They are a different type of creature. Spiritual guides are usually... um, very, very advanced master souls. But you also have to be very discerning about those who present as either, really, because of the fact that you can be deceived by the dark side. talk a lot in my books about how you discern the presence of those to make sure that you are being very careful about being taught only by the light and not being deceived by darkness. That's very important. But this is where it's really important. You know, the hierarchy of the angels is a different magnitude, different order of being that God created that is, you know, literally just elementally different than a human being. And that's what makes them different. Spiritual guides can be, uh, there are times when you might meet one that might be of a different order of being, but they won't be, you know, uh, of the angelic hierarchy, even though we will sometimes be taught by some of the angelic hierarchy as well as being protected by them. But spiritual guides usually are variant levels of master souls and spirits who are serving God by giving back and teaching other souls uh, from what they have learned. So they're a different order of beings. Very often human beings who crossed over, maybe, you know, with a lot of them a long time ago. These are beings who have advanced long beyond the human being state. And that's what we need here. We need someone who um, has passed through these gates and knows how to do it and can guide us so that we will do the same. Um, But again, um, there's going to be variations in both aspects. So this is like a, a very general way to define that difference. But also remember, you know, people can have, like grandpa can be, you know, your grandchildren's uh, guardian angel. That doesn't mean grandpa is a guardian angel by order of being. It means grandpa is doing that as his service on, on in the afterlife on the other side. He's still a human being who has been given that task and who is doing it out of probably love for his family, but he can operate in that capacity. And, you know, same thing with, you know, grandparents, great-grandparents, ancestors. They can operate where they will advise people in their out-of-body travels or sometimes in their dreams because they do sometimes have wisdom to offer. So in that capacity, they might be operating as like a spiritual guide. Do you see what I'm saying, the difference there? Mm -hmm. Um, But it would not change their order of being. That would not change the fact that this would be um, them offering from their source of wisdom from their life as opposed to like, for, for instance, a great master soul who's, whose, you know, station, they might not have a different order of being, but they might have a station as teacher in the higher spheres and the vibration might be so much higher than us that there's very little resemblance 
between us um, vibrationally and as a soul. But um, so you can have different souls operate in different capacities, but in terms of of the differences, you do have orders of being, you do have the spiritual guides who can be, you know, literally just evolved very far beyond where we are. And they are very generously giving their service to help us to do the same. So can, so can one individual have more than just one spirit guide? Absolutely. Um, uh, what you're going to find, you know, speaking of the spiritual guides and the ones who are spiritual teachers, you very often will see that, especially in the beginning, there will maybe be one at a time, but they will follow each other, just as I mentioned, where there might be a period of time where they focus on one type of thing and then another teacher jumps in. But definitely, definitely, as a soul continues to progress, and this can happen at any point in the journey, depending on, you know, how God deems it necessary, Mm -hmm. we can all have um, multiple different types of spirit guides who would be directing our path for various uh, things. And this is necessary because we... um, you know, think of the, the, each spiritual guardian would be teaching us of something. For instance, um, like Emmanuel was one of my early spiritual teachers teaching me about oneness, but then you have need to be learning about discernment. So you have others who come in like Kutahe came in and started that whole thing going. And then you have another and another and another, and these are all just spiritual concepts you have to learn. And so you have a lot of them over an entire lifetime. Um, And certainly they do overlap. And there are times when you might have a whole bunch of them at the same time, and they might be coming to guide you about something, which is very, very important because those who come to you and claim to be a spiritual guide, you need to do a lot of extra discernment with because they can be impure. And this is something that I was taught by the spirit of Paramahamsa Yogananda, that this is just extremely important because that particular area allows for the most um, contamination or just um, deception. And that's something that a soul has to learn. So when you say spirit guides, you want to be cautious about moving forward in that that you understand that there has to be a lot of discernment and discretion going on because there are things like lost souls, wandering spirits, and other things like that also. Um, Usually when you're dealing with a spiritual guide, you're coming from the space where you're also going to have um, a lot of astral entities that could also interfere with you and they will pose as spiritual guides. So I teach a lot in my book, the mysteries of the redemption and its sequels about how you can learn to discern these things because you can be easily led astray if you are not very, very discerning. And that's extremely important as you progress further. Um, you're going to find that you, you still have to do that. You still have to do that. But as you move into higher and higher spheres for your training, you're not going to have as many astral entities that are going to kind of tag along. So it's not going to be as easily done. This is one of the things that really um, you want to put out there for people who are beginning their path. They don't realize that the astral plane is full of tricksters. 
And that's when you need to be very careful. And unfortunately, that's also when most people are beginning and they don't realize that. And so it's an important thing to make people aware of. So in your experience, and this could be a hard question to answer, but because this could be a case by case basis, but in your experience, when you're you're discerning and you're trying to and and you're figuring out whether okay this is pure or or impure, I mean, what are some like uh, what what do you do uh, with you in your experience to help you discern whether this is a, a legitimate spirit guide versus not? Well, one very simple one that you can throw out. Um, and this can, this can be really important, um, because sometimes even, um, you may have souls around you who have their own intentions. They may not even be out of bad intentions, but they're not for your highest good. So this is what you do. You say, are you here on behalf of Jesus Christ? Did the Lord God send you here on my behalf. And uh, if you say that, um, a lot of spirits are going to look down, turn, and walk away. What The reason you want to do this is because you want to make sure that you're not being influenced by the whims of wandering souls. And that can happen. And people forget this. This is part of the reason why um, you don't want to mess around with things like Ouija boards because, you know, those who are actually of the order of angels do not respond to Ouija boards. You're going to be getting the response of wandering spirits, lost souls, and in some instances, you know, darker or demonic things. That's why that becomes such a doorway for the negative problems that can happen. Um, so, you know, simple questions like that. Are you here on behalf of our Lord Jesus Christ? Did he send you to help me? Um, you can say, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who was sent down from heaven, was incarnate of the Virgin Mary? You know, there are a lot of uh, prayers that you can put out there as well. Um, there's some things you can say, like Christ crucified, that if you're dealing with a demonic force who is in disguise, they can't stand that. And uh, it actually burns the skin of demons, and they will have to show you who they really are. Um, another one that uh, is the first stanza of the Our Father. I, can, I call it the most powerful uh, exorcism prayer, but I will defer to the real exorcists on that. <laughs> but, you know, you say that over and over and spirits have to reveal who they are. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you listen to those words, you'll understand why that is effective. You know, I had to experience it before I could try to figure out why it was effective. You're asking that the Lord's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. They can't handle this. Um, what you'll find is that, uh, first of all, these are the kinds of things that they cannot handle. They cannot, um, they, if there's an eternal law which requires them to reveal their true identity when um, you do these things. And they will. And if, for instance, if you do this discernment and it turns out to be a real um, holy angel from an angelic order or someone who was sent on behalf of the Lord, they will look at you and they will prove to you. They will turn to you with great joy. They will show you their light and they will thank you for practicing the discernment that you should be practicing because it's so important. And so they will prove to you that they are who they say they are. And so when we do this discernment, we're not hurting anybody's feelings. In fact, we are showing um, 
the, you know, we are showing the Lord and we are showing the beings who occupy the lighted side of the universe that we are exhibiting proper self discernment and discernment towards the spirit world, which is honored and respected and they are grateful for it. So that's important for people to understand too. There are a lot of different ways, you know, there are other things too. These are the, probably the top ones that I've used, but I, you know, you got the St. Michael prayer. Um, a lot of times, um, uh, if you feel like there's something that is impure that is bothering you or anything like that, you can utilize like the Latin rite exorcism, just get a CD or an MP3 file and just let it run. You know, um, there's one on YouTube that's actually approved by a Bishop. You can use that. It's helpful. Um, but you want to always make sure that you are inquiring as to whether someone has come to you on behalf of our Lord. And um, they have to answer that truthfully. Mm -hmm. And so it's very important. So I had a listener uh, mention asking it for a blessing. Is that also another viable option? To do what? Uh, to ask it for a blessing. Um... I, I think that I would be more comfortable asking for a blessing if I knew for sure who it was first. Mm -hmm. So that's what, that's what I would think of there. Just you want to make sure you know who you're asking for a blessing from first. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the particular dangers of not validating your spirit guide? Um, well, the dangers are anything from just being mildly deceived to actual possession, you know, so it <laughs> runs the gamut. It's a pretty wide gamut. Um, you, um, you know, when you're dealing like with people who play around with Ouija boards, um, this is where a lot of the openings are where, uh, darker spirits can come in when you're dealing with astral travel you have the same issue you have to be aware of this because when you first start experiencing astral projection you are dealing mostly with third and fourth realm travel and that's where you're going to run into a lot of lost souls and wandering spirits um and uh that's where you can end up with attachments and, you know, just for those who are listening who might, I might be freaking out and I'm not trying to, I do have some books that, you know, you can look at on these subjects in particular at the website. It's outofbodytravel.org. You can download these for free. It's under out of body travel books on the mystic knowledge series. There's a book called ghosts and lost souls. There's also a book called Spiritual Warfare, Angels, and Demons, and there's others there, too. There's about 14 volumes in that series, so you can pick whatever subject you feel is going to help you with whatever you're dealing with. But literally, yeah, you can run from the gamut of just being mildly deceived to uh, possession. And so, you know, people might think, well, being mildly deceived is not that big a deal, but it really is because all that has to happen with um, the dark side is they throw in, you know, 80 or 90 percent truth and then they throw in 10 percent deception. Once they get something like that established, then you can start being deceived on a much major, much more serious level. And so then you are literally being slowly piecemealed to go in a different direction or veer off onto another path that is not really what is the highest path for you in God's eyes. Um, and the things that will be suggested will be, first of all, false views, false beliefs, um, false understandings. And so, you know, um, there is a lot that can be said about these subjects, but you know, the thing that you want to come back to is if you are pursuing the out of body experience with the inherent goal of 
wanting to improve upon your spiritual life, wanting to get closer to God, then you're going to do best by utilizing discernment and understanding that whatever God has intended for you as his highest path for you is going to be better than anything you can think up or obviously any lost or wandering spirit thinks up or obviously even more dark or demonic spirit. And so you want to get rid of anything that is going to lead to attachments to elements that are going to pull you back, that are going to drag you into the darkness or drag you into any kind of false views or, um, even just, you know, the things that uh, the darker things will do. They'll, you know, despair, depression, the things that come with them that they will do. Uh, you certainly can be uh, attached to, you know, a lot of the situations with lost souls, uh, you can be, you can get attachments from, spirits that are of a lower nature and you are much better served and they are much better served by you going through the proper mystical training that God provides that allows you to learn how to actually help them to cross over successfully without causing you harm. And that will be provided to you if you are sincerely seeking that out of body travel and mystical path with the correct intention, which is the serving God and creation rather than serving the self. And if you do that and you follow the guidelines and that you'll be taught these things too, these, these things about discernment and stuff, um, you don't have to just believe me, but you're going to find that if you're following this path, you're going to be taught this. It's part of the mystical training you receive from above. So, there, yeah, there's a lot to be said about it, but important for people to know that um, it's, it's all available and it, it's not as complicated as we're probably making it sound tonight, but, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, um, we, we've discussed them coming to us. Now, how do we find out, like, who our spirit guide is? I mean, if we wanted to go in and, and seek our, our, our spirit guide, how do we do that? And how do we connect with them? And how do we communicate with them? Well, a lot depends on if you're talking about doing so through out-of-body travel or other uh, things. The, the thing that I would recommend to most is ask in prayer and, you know, and be receptive to whatever God allows you to know. So you might receive that answer in a dream. You might receive it in an out-of-body experience. Um, in my experiences, uh, I would meet my spiritual guides when I least expected to, and they would be introduced to me and I would have a very, very abrupt meeting where they, I would learn of them. Sometimes I would learn their name and then I would get a sense of a little bit of information about what they were going to be working on teaching me. Um, I know that sometimes people worry too much about the names. I hear a lot of, because uh, uh, I hear from a lot of people about their experiences. And people will have these experiences where they see what is very clearly a master teacher has come, but they're not given the name. And one thing to remember is that the name isn't necessarily important. If it is important, they'll tell you. <laughs> you know, if it's not then it's not. And then if, don't focus on what's not important. Focus on what is given you to know. So if the teacher's focus, whatever the teacher's focus is, is where your focus should be. So whatever that teacher is focusing on, look where that teacher is looking. And so you want to show respect, but do not worship them. 
they get very upset about that <laughs> because right. they will tell you as well, I am not God. I am another creature just like you worship God. So you want to, you want to look at them as the uh, more highly advanced beings that they are and te- treat them with respect, but do not worship them. Treat them with the respect that they deserve as someone who is lowering themselves to guide you. So with humility and regard and attentiveness. Um, one of the things that I teach people to do when I'm doing spiritual counseling, and my books do this as well, is um, to learn how to look for the right details in the experiences that you do have so that you are looking for the important points in what you've been shown and that you're actually catching the most important parts of the message. Sometimes people get caught up in only the peripheral details and they miss an important element of the actual teaching. So pay exact attention. If your spiritual guide says something to you, and if you are able to recall that, write it down word for word. Do not change a word. Just write it down because you're going to be you're going to be looking at this and these words and meditating upon them to try to understand what they're telling you. You also want to pay attention to the energy that's being emitted during the experience. Sometimes the teaching is encompassed in what you feel like uh, when you're learning about oneness, you're going to learn about oneness by experiencing it as a universal Uh, uniting with all of life. So the teaching is going to happen where you're going to experience it. There's a lot of things that you're going to experience in that way. So you're going to want to pay attention to what are the things that you felt powerfully during the event and um, don't focus on things that they don't focus on. If they don't want to tell you their, their name, it's probably not important. If, um, you know, if they don't want to tell you where they're from or, you know, those kinds of things. As humans, sometimes I hear a lot of people focus on those particular details and they'll miss the things like the exact words they said or, but I felt this profound impulse of loving vibration. And I'm like, okay, well, that's the message then. You're missing the message by focusing on the peripheral. Mm -hmm. So we, and you know, every case will be different and it will continue to expand and grow because you go from, you know, being initiated into the love of God, the unconditional love of God, the unity of humankind, but you also then have to learn about good and evil. You have to learn about the energetic truth and eternal law and the multiplicity of realms and the interdimensional nature of the higher, middle, and lower spheres. And so there is so much to be learning that this is something that you're going to be doing for a long time, so you're going to want to pay attention to where they put your attention. That's the biggest thing. Put your attention where they put it and let them lead you that way. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but uh, we kind of would go a little more in depth about it. Um, sure. Now, our, now, spirit guides and, and guardian angels, do they reside here in our realm or do Do they come from a a different realm and like how many realms are there and how they kind of like tie together? Well, there's an infinity of realms and, you know, we have an infinity of light realms. We have an infinity of purgation realms and we have an infinity of hell realms. And so there is, it literally is infinite Um, So like with guardian angels, they all come from uh, different uh, dimensional spheres related to their order. And with the spiritual guides and teachers, their their home vibration, or so to speak, 
is where they come from. But when they come to teach us, we can look at this like a missionary going to Africa for something or, uh, you know, a nurse or doctor going to another country to provide medical care where they don't have medical care. It's a mission that they're doing. So they are thrusting themselves down below to the earthly sphere. They're going on a mission to provide a service to us because we need it. So it's possible that they will reside here for a time. It's possible that they will literally just come down for short bursts, but their home, their home vibrational sphere will be, you know, in a very different location. Um, but no, they don't, they don't come from here. Now, like with the spirit guides, originally you have to realize that uh, creation continues to create, and these are the the beings that have graduated from this realm and who have moved way way beyond and well beyond. Um, so at one time they probably moved through a mortal realm like what we live in, which is the third and fourth sphere. They probably moved through that, which is part of the reason they're qualified to now teach us. Um, but they may very well be, you know, like in the 23rd dimension or above, you know what I mean? So, so they can be coming from any number. It could be fifth dimension. It could be 23rd. Sometimes it's well above, you know, like a hundredth or higher dimensions. And with the angels, they're all different vibrations. So when you're dealing with like seraphim, cherubim versus like even like archangels, they're all very different vibrations and different orders of being. So each one of those orders of beings resides in a different sphere. So generally none of them come from here, but some of them might be doing some time here to do service. So we talk about how they come in and they, they, they teach us spiritually and from time to time they overlap. So do spirit guides and guardian angels, do they communicate uh, between each other and work hand in hand? Or is this kind of a more of a, they work separately and as these teachings go together, they just naturally overlap? What here's something that'll be hard to put in words, but I'll try, is part of what a soul learns, but it, you learn it on such a basic level when you're having your first out-of-body experiences, mm -hmm. is the oneness of all life. Mm -hmm. As you progress, literally 15, 20 years into the future, if you're progressing steadily and deeply, you might experience what that means as the universal consciousness of all being. Mm -hmm. Then you might take it, you know, 20, 25, 30 years into the future if you are, again, proceeding with great intensity and depth, and you might, like, experience existence from the throne room of God, which would be the actual manifestation of the current of life as it moves through all creation. And then what you're going to see there is that it all happens in a split second from the mind of God. And that's how we all operate. And so it is a very hard thing to comprehend unless you see it. But it begins with understanding that all things are one and that they all operate from the thrust that comes from God. So there doesn't necessarily have to be this, uh, this communication in the way that we would view it. There's more of a... There's more of a spontaneous influence of inspiration that comes from literally the, the workings of evolution coming from the throne room. Um, and this is very hard to understand. Does that mean they don't communicate at all? No, probably not. But the way that they would communicate was probably very different than what we would communicate or what we would view as communication. And it would probably happen in a split second in a way that we would not understand. Mm 
or that would be like so beyond our ability to even conceive of as communication. So yes, they do all work together in concert and absolutely there is one mind behind that and that is God. It's like, uh, you know, an engine of a car, how it all works in one piece, and yet there's all these pieces that are just naturally working together. It's like anything like that, where, um, where, where the, there is, you know, you turn the ignition, and that ignition sets all those things in motion, and that's God, you know. So um, they do, but it's very different and it's very spontaneous and instant because it's operating within the universal being, the whole consciousness that operates in a unity that is so far beyond our understanding. Even those who may understand that there is a oneness between all life, this is taking it like a thousand times further out when you actually see how that operates. It's a beautiful thing. It's mind blending, but it's, it's, you know, it's kind of like when you're trying to understand all the things like, uh, you just can't unless you are taken into the vibration of it and allowed to witness it. It's, uh, but, but yes, they do all communicate, but not in the way we would think. Okay. So you have a book that's going to be releasing here soon called uh, Dialogues with the Mystic, and it uh, shows the spiritual counseling process. Can you share a little bit more with us about that? Sure. That one was released on Easter, and Dialogues with the Mystic was um, the result of one of my clients and I um, had so many um, correspondences between us that we decided to uh, put that together in a book. And actually, we didn't decide to. I was ordered to in my out-of-body experiences. <laughs> um, but um, it does it does chart uh, the the uh, spiritual counseling process that I did with him. Um, for the first several months, we're hoping to do a volume two and three. Um, we just have to go through several thousand emails to get it all re, you know, I have to re-edit and get it all formulated so that it's helpful to our average reader. But volume one was released on Easter and, um, it really goes into a lot of subjects and shows you kind of like some of the basic things that you would be learning um, as you're going through spiritual counseling with me, so you can, you know, you can um, kind of read that book in tandem with Come to Wisdom's Door and the Mysteries of the Redemption, which all of these you can download at the site for free or you can purchase them in any of the formats you prefer. And those are the, the books that I recommend when you're starting. And I think Dialogues with a Mystic is going to be helpful to a lot of people to assist them in understanding that, uh, this process, this process um, of the details and how they they work with these other things as you're moving through uh, this process. The other thing too, yesterday, um, Casey Armstrong's Simply Amazing Women was released, and I was included with uh, uh, twelve other women um, who were. Uh, written little biographical chapters about us as to some of the things that we've uh, experienced. And I was very honored to be included in that book. It's called Simply Amazing Women. That was released yesterday um, by Casey Armstrong, former producer of the Howard Stern Show. Mm -hmm. So um, check that out, too. That's at Barnes & Noble and all your booksellers and things like that. Okay, so you founded the uh, Out of Body Travel uh, Foundation back in 2003. Uh, what led you to uh, start this? Well, it was a series of events. You know, I had my first two books published by Hampton Roads Publishers in 1990 and 91. And um, ironically, it was one of my former publishers who felt that I had a niche market and suggested it years before I did it. 
um, that uh, I could corner the market, so to speak. Um, but it was after Mother Teresa said that she felt that the spiritual poverty in the West was more serious than the physical poverty in the East, that um, it really hit me that um, we needed to reduce spiritual poverty worldwide. So we founded the Out of Body Travel Foundation in 2003, made our books available for free download at outofbodytravel.org. I also have paintings and music that I've all stuff I've seen and heard and out of body experiences. You can download all that too for free and um, lots of other resources as well. Course of study there, free, all of the, you know, interviews and stuff, you can check that out. We also have author Q&A, um, which a lot of people really find helpful. Um, and so we do those kinds of things. And then, you know, a couple years later, we had that horrible tsunami. We started raising money for a lot of different um, uh, charitable organizations and things like that. Um, to try to help with physical poverty as well, because we do know that physical poverty is a problem. If you ever want to pursue your spiritual path, um, you need to have some level of physical stability in order to really be able to do that. So we started with a lot of projects with disaster relief and then building houses. We dug some a bunch of wells and um, sponsored a lot of children in different places and you can see all that at the website too and you can help us out we have a family we're trying to support in Venezuela who's been under the you know the Maduro regime and so we're trying to keep them going and right now we're also raising money for the Foundation for Children in Need for um, sponsorships for children so um, check that out too when you go to outofbodytravel.org. Okay, so thank you, Marilyn, for coming in and sharing your experiences with us and your knowledge on this. Uh, Marilyn will be back with us on May 30th. Uh, we'll be uh, discussing spiritual wear welfare, angels and demons, and uh, how that all tie uh, ties into our mortal realm. So thank you, Marilyn, for, for joining us this evening. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you, Adam. I've been very happy to be here. I appreciate the invite. Thank you so much. Also, May 15th, we also have Jeff Harmon with us, and he is a second-generation astrologer. If you've listened to him on Coast to Coast, you already know who he is. Uh, he is uh, a astrologer, spiritual consultant, and exorcist slash property clearer with uh, over 40 years of experience. Uh, he believes that conscious self-awareness can lead us out of our uh, matrix of our comic past. So uh, don't want to miss that. That's on May 15th. Thank you guys for listening, and we will see you on the 15th. If you enjoyed our show tonight, head on over to Paranormal Engaged on Facebook. And stay up to date on the latest news. And don't forget to click that like button. To find more about upcoming shows and guest information, stop by www.paranormalengaged.com. Paranormal Engaged can be found on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcast, and can be played on Alexa with a Podbean skill. 